Good. So, in Berlin time, Viennese time, Central European time, it's six o'clock, five minutes p.m. My name is Matthias, together with Pascal from Vienna. I'm cordially welcoming you to our case reading session. Many well-known faces. I just went briefly through our list, which my secretary just forwarded me well-known names. But what is at least mo as as wonderful that also new faces have joined us. So please forgive those of you who have been friends for a long time already. A quick introduction, literally going to five minutes. Uh, why we are here, why we are so passionate about doing this School of Radiology. This is Werner, our mentor and our lately friend who has been basically yeah, created the fundamental basis of what, all what we are doing here. And we, here I'm talking about Pascal and me, but also you, who led the foundation of Breast MR beginning in the early 80s, who basically um, founded the fundament of the breast uh, Byrates lexicon, uh, who already in the 90s summarized all the bases, dynamic contrast and imaging, diffusion, spectroscopy, in a pivotal book, and who we had the privilege and real honor to work with uh, during the last 10 years of his life. Werner died uh, in 2013, so 10 years ago, one decade already ago, from brain cancer. And Werner is basically all with us today and all with us if we are doing breast MR. I think this is honor where honor is due. And this basically is the foundation of our passion for teaching and for doing this together because teamwork, this always has been the core of uh, yeah, my collaboration with Pascal. And hopefully those of you who already joined us for a course or two will agree that team is really all about fun and about teaching success. And both, I think, is important. This is us. 15 years ago already, Pascal, a little bit bolder. But at least now we have at least as much fun in doing breast MR as we had that time ago. And this is, I think, most important. And we did teaching basically with the first hour when we started research, because research and teaching is really something which should go together. Um, and this is what we have been doing face to face and which we will do this week, Pascal, in Nizza, France, in the Yusobi Brestemar course. So maybe we'll see some faces of you there live. But we think it's not only face to face, traveling around, having lovely dinners with good friends, but also online. And this is why we founded the School of Radiology two years ago, 2021. And why is that so cool? I hope you all agree after that course. We are really independent. We can do what we want. And this is sometimes important because this is so quick. Uh, but more important, we can share the images in a very high quality. Today, it's going to be 2K. And it's super time efficient. So I had an extremely busy day today. Pascal had two, and I'm sure many of you also had. But just five minutes ago, I got the slides from Pascal by WhatsApp. And now we are here. Uh, time efficient, connecting worldwide and sharing up-to-date knowledge. Talking about up-to-date, we're going to share with you new cases today and uh, also um, standard knowledge or a mixture of both. And it's going to be interactive. And this is why I, I invite you while you're listening to me, uh, having a lunch or dinner or having a cup of tea or coffee, whatever. Uh, enjoy. Uh, install on your second device on your Zoom and the Zoom app because this is very easy to use and this allows you to uh, answer the polls during the case read very interactively. So just download a Zoom app on uh, on your Mac, on your Android or whatever. So you have one screen for, for the pictures and now for the shared screen later for the cases and your Zoom for reading. And for those of you who are going to join us in Nizza in a couple of days, uh, already install that because we do the same thing here. And once again, all here is about teaching, passion, but it's also about fun. Uh, because uh, fun is really something which drives motivations. And this is what the School of Radiology is all about. We are doing a lot of stuff. Please have a look on our webpage, not to make advertisement, but to say we there's way more about than just case reading sessions. There will be a summer school together with Laszlo Tabar, but there will be, if you like, the way we are teaching today, two one-day courses with new cases, July 1st and July, July 9th. And they're going to be a breast basic course, and they're going to be a breast MR advanced course 
two weekends in a row, all going to be videotaped. So if you miss them due to time difference, not a problem. Please come and join. This is a unique experience and a lot of fun. But while I'm still talking, Pascal, I already will open my first question uh, because we just want to know the background of you. Once again, I would say one third are well-known friends already, faces, attendees of our courses, but the other ones we don't know the background. Just to have a slight idea where you're from, what's your uh, um, experience in breast imaging, and more important, what's your experience in breast MR. This is number one. And the second reason why I'm just opening this poll specifically for you at home, at work, wherever you are, please uh, make familiar with yourself with the Zoom app. But this is so quickly, I am got the feeling this runs very well. And while you are doing this, please remind that we have a wonderful summer school together with our dear friend Laszlo Tabar at the end of July um, on mammography and breast imaging. It's going to be an awesome event. Just had another call with, Pas uh, with Laszlo Tabar the other day. All right. So, Pascal, while I'm showing the final slides of our upcoming courses, which you please check uh, once in a while also on our webpage, and I have a quick look on the polls. Well, almost everybody has answered. Let's wait a little bit more. And maybe, Pascal, you already uh, share your screen because now it's uh, 6 o'clock, 10 minutes, exactly the time which we scheduled to start the real show, which is a primer how to read uh, breast MR and uh, how to assess it. For those of you who already joined our courses, this is a brief recapitulation, but as the Latin say, repetencia est mater studiorum. So the more you learn, the better you know. The more you repeat, the better you are. Um, and then we are ready for the cases, Pascal. Excellent. Should we close the poll or do you want to, want to keep it open, Matthias? Uh, I would close it. And while you are sharing, which you, I think, are not yet doing, aren't you? Are you? I, I think I am. Okay, yes, yes so there you go. All just... the many screens of yours. So this is beautiful. This is a primer. It can be, of course, only a primer because we want to uh, look for some cases, right, Matthias? So it's just exactly. And let's yeah. have a talking about looking, Pascal. Um, just have a quick look on the on the polls. At the question, so, right? Otherwise, exactly. Uh... So uh, now you see uh, the results of your voting, and please make familiar familiar yourself with that because after that we're going to use this for pirates rating and assessment. So this is not just a toy; it's really important for our teaching approach. So we were successful in uh, getting the target group we want, which is mainly breast imagers, but I also very, very welcome the all-rounders and those of you who have not yet fallen into love with breast imaging. That is an awesome sub-discipline. Please uh, consider to specialize in that. You are uh, very experienced at breast imaging, 50%, yes, but they are also um, newcomers and intermediate, which is very important. And uh, I think what is very important, Pascal, we should keep that in mind. Um, although you are all very experienced in breast imaging in general, the average level in uh, breast MR is either beginner or intermediate. Only one third said, I am advanced. I think this is important. And this is why we are really passionate about these courses, because um, sharing knowledge about how to read breast MR is, is, is really important, because it's not yet the mainstream uh, methodology we would very much wish it would be and become. Pascal, the word is your and I'm experienced and excited. <laughs> Thank you, Matthias. So, uh, dear colleagues, uh, who has heard the talk, it's uh, basically a very, very abbreviated part. So why do we use breast MRI? Where is the use of that? Well, first of all, we have to uh, be sure that we understand that's mainly due to contrast enhancing. We inject IV contrast, and that's why MRI is so sensitive. It's not only the soft tissue contrast of MRI, which is very, very beneficial because MRI is much more sensitive than X-ray-based techniques for contrast, but it is really the presence of enhancement can indicate a cancer. And the other way around, if I don't have an enhancement, I can reliably exclude breast cancer if, of course, the examination is technically adequate. I've seen so many cases where people told me, well, I had this non-enhancing cancer, and actually I could till now discard any one of them. So if you find one, please let me always have a look. I'm, I'm always interested in collecting these cases. And as I said, till now, it's a bit like with ghost stories. 
Um, I've not seen the ghost yet. I've not seen the really not enhancing cancer. So the issue why we are actually talking, what I need to talk about breast MRI is that it can be cancer because enhancements needs, need to be distinguished. And that's what our case reading session today is a bit about. So, but talking about indications, where should we then apply breast MRI? And I know there is a lot of controversial discussions, mainly because I think we sometimes go too much into details because what is absolutely true is that MRI, due to its high sensitivity, could be used in any situation where conventional imaging does not suffice, right? Meaning that I already know that with conventional imaging, I'm either blind, I find multiple unspecific findings because conventional imaging is unspecific without contrast. I can just see densities and lesions and potentially calcifications, uh, but not much more. Uh, but we can also pin it down to some indications. There is no discussion that MRI plays a major role or could play a major role in screening. The issue with MRI and screening is that it is expensive and availability is limited. So in the recent decades, it has been used for high-risk screening, while it increasingly is known nowadays, but just based on put in prospective trials, like the DANCE trial, that MRI is also an adequate tool in women with mammographically dense breasts. That all has a level of evidence grade one. Where it really can be translated into clinical practice, where we can really do screening in this larger population of women, it remains to be seen, actually. Specifical, there is an other indication, and that is the so-called problem solving. Problem solving is basically all recalled from screening or symptomatic women which receive a conventional imaging PPV1 recall. What is just a short recap of PPV1 recall? It's a positive predictive value and there are different ways of calculating the positive predictive value of breast imaging. It's basically everything which is unclear. Where it's zero, three, four, probably even five, it's all those cases where I do not have a direct biopsy target. Of course, it's not that single, lesion that's big as my fist and I can palpate it. That's not a problem solving case. A problem solving case is what everyone who knows it, who does it in clinical practice, breast imaging knows there's these lesions there. Yes, you have some calcification, but is it really suspicious? And oh, by the way, it is multicentric or, or bilateral. And should I, should I biopsy five calcification clusters? That's one of the problem solving situations. I don't have a dedicated target. And then, of course, the oldest indications like staging and treatment monitoring of neoadjuvant treatments, that is classical indications, even though the level of evidence in that aspect, also because it is more difficult to investigate, is much more difficult. So what are all the prerequisites for breast MRI? Well, we start with the appointment. If you got the appointment, it's the first opportunity to check that you really know why you're doing the MRI. That can be really should be started at this level. What is the exact reason for referral? What are previous findings? What do previous reports say? You should collect that uh, information at the level where you do the appointment. Of course, at the same in the same moment, you have to check the MRI eligibility, like check implants, allergies, kidney function. Kidney function, you only need to check it if it is, there is a known kidney disease. The European Society of Urogenital Radiology in their guidelines tell you that you don't need to check uh, the uh, creatinine value or the kidney function uh, if there is no history and no point, hint at, at uh, kidney disease. The timing is, uh, has been discussed also for decades. It is not necessary to time a breast MRI exam in a premenopausal woman in the second week of the menstrual cycle. I would actually only do that if you got, for instance, elective like screening cases. Yeah, there it makes sense. But actually only population of women where it makes sense is those women where you have had an examination, where she has had distinct proliferative background enhancement and where you need a short-term follow-up or long-term follow-up. Then it makes actually sense to schedule in the second week of the menstrual cycle. Otherwise, it's a logistic nightmare and there is no evidence whatsoever that this is really detrimental for diagnostic accuracy. Now we are at the department level. There, of course, you check again the referral sheet and secure prior imaging and reports. You can do reporting of breast MRI without prior imaging and even without prior reports, but everyone knows 
breast imaging is multimodal and the more information you get, the better your diagnosis is. If you, for instance, don't know that the woman has a subtle bloody discharge on her left nipple, you will probably overlook the small focus, which is introductory, which you would have spotted, but you, would, you will miss it because uh, you didn't know the reason for referral. I've seen it multiple times of those patients coming into our assessment center with negative MRI reports uh, because the, the reading radiologist just didn't know that they should put particular attention on that retroareolar area, area on the left side. Most, of course, informed consent. When you obtain the conformed, uh, uh, informed consent, that's the moment where you can build a connection with the patient, either your technical personnel or you. But there you can explain what is done, why it's, impo why it's important to hold fast, that you don't move, what's the sense behind the examination, and also show some empathy for the woman who, in whatever the indication is, is for sure very, very nervous. Then, of course, IV access, I can strongly recommend because it's one of the major pitfalls even in the year 2023, uh, check the IV access. So you have to, uh, uh, you have, to uh, have a needle because you want to inject contrast. But just if you just take some, uh, some, some saline solution and just, uh, just push it through and feel whether it's really working, that is really, uh, if it is really good uh, invested uh, um, effort. It's a little effort, which is a well, it's a, it's a great investment. I would strongly recommend to paralyze all those procedures with trained technical personnel because stress technical personnel stresses out the patient. The patient will move, and the personnel will make mistakes. That is really one of the things that's really really important here. Now, examination protocol. We are nearing the end of this this primer. The examination protocol needs to be as long as necessary, but as short as possible. So you don't need extra planes, for instance, like in sagittal or coronal view, I always acquire axial views only. If you do batch examinations like breast, 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 and not liver, breast, prostate, then uh, you're much faster. And generally in breast MRI, I would strongly suggest you to stick to your protocol because the protocols, they, uh, if they vary, you don't have any anatomical stability where you, where you, where you can uh, a walk along. So you don't have a guidance uh, because uh, in the, each breast can look absolutely different. Of course, there's types of breasts, but it's not like in the brain or the liver where you have the always underlying anatomy to guide you. So stick to your protocol and the protocol axial is an example. About two minutes takes a long equal time T2 sequence, then a diffusion weighted sequence. You can, if you have the time, acquire it as well, or instead of T2, you acquire a stir sequence. And then come the contrast enhanced sequences. Here, I strongly recommend uh, not to do too much images because the diagnostic benefit is not too high. Uh, I would use a maximum spatial resolution, maximum image quality. If you have a normal temporal resolution, about one minute or so, then you need to ensure that there is an injection delay between the contrast uh, application and the acquisition of the first post contrast images because otherwise you are too early and you miss the enhancement peak and you can mistake the curve types. That's actually everything I need to do, say for the protocol. Very important because I know that there are always questions uh, regarding abbreviated protocols and so something that has been discussed uh, a lot in recent years. Always uh, keep in mind that the whole examination time is to a large part due to non-value added time, so not the scanning time itself. So if you just skip some of or all of those sequences, you have abbreviated the scanning time, but not so much the overall time, even in the shortest abbreviation protocols. And actually, as you will see on the next two slides, uh, we need all those diagnostic information. To assess now the diagnostic information, if you see the images, I would you always uh, suggest a standardized reading layout. The reading layout should be that you have all the diagnostic information at the same hand. You can always zoom in all images at the same time. It should be all be linked. The window center settings should be standardized and so on and so on. We will look at through this, but this is our standard solution for two monitor solution. It's basically two monitors and, uh, and all sequences you need at all. Uh, at all time points. Now, you got an enhancing lesion like in this case, and we will, we will discuss this case. Um, 
the first question is, is do we have any enhancement? Because if we don't have an enhancement, we have a very high negative predictive value. We can exclude invasive breast cancer and largely also uh, DCS. Of course, we can't exclude the two millimeter DCS, right? So if the reason for referral was one millimeter amorphic calcification, well, I can only say there's no significant disease, right? But you can have mass and non-mass enhancements. And why is it important? Because mass and non-mass enhancements they are associated with different biological correlates. A mass enhancement is usually the differential diagnosis between a fibroadenoma or something like a fibroadenoma and a carcinoma. Of course, there are small differentials. The most important are written down there, but that's actually the, 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 the story. So it's rather simple. Non-masses are a bit more difficult because we may either have inflammatory or proliferative activity. Sometimes it's difficult to distinguish them. The proliferative activity is more structured, but the proliferations can be proliferations of ATP and can be carcinoma in situ and so on. You see, there is more a gradual increase of malignancy, so it's much more difficult to distinguish between them. How do we do this now to distinguish between benign and malignant enhancements? Well, we use structured reporting and we combine the structured reporting with the Kaiser score, named after Werner Kaiser, our mentor, which is a machine learning derived clinical decision rule, which just uses the Byrats criteria in a structured way. This decision rule uh, can be used like a flow chart. You check whether there's an announcing lesion, whether there are speculations, what the curve type is, and then a final question. It's two to three questions, and they end up with a diagnostic category ranging from one to 11. And that is associated with increasing levels of malignancy so without any clinical information, just as a rule of thumb, you can see on the right side of the screen that everything above uh, the Kaiser score four is at least a little bit suspicious and should be biopsied. And more important, everything above a Kaiser score of seven is highly suspicious. So in case you get a benign result, you should double check that this is consistent with the imaging findings. If you assess, however, these features, and these features are semantic features, so something we describe, birads, like morphology, it's no computer stuff, except the algorithm is the computer stuff, but you always need to keep in mind that a feature should be always assigned if it has a definite, uh, a, a definite um, a phenotype of the feature. Meaning, if you assess margins, and you know birads margins can be circumscribed, can be non-circumscribed, can be speculated. And you see circumscribed speaks for a benign lesion and speculated speaks for a malignant lesion or points out a malignant lesion. So an unspecific criterion in this case is not circumscribed. So if you don't think this is definitely circumscribed, it is not circumscribed. If you don't see a speculation which you can show to your neighbor, it is not circumscribed. That's called the basis or default category. The same applies to every single criterion. For instance, the curve type, that's of course a plateau because we Plateau means could be everything. Washout suggests malignancy, persistent, suggests a benign finding. So it's always in case of thought you apply the default category. And this tool uh, has been integrated in, in our free online decision support tool, which I strongly suggest uh, you can open us on your mobile device uh, when we go through the cases, because this online free version, you just click it on, and then with imaging examples, it follows the Kaiser score. And also has some text examples where you can see in which specific situation the Kaiser score should be probably interpreted in a different manner. That's something we cover in extensive in our courses. Uh, today it's a bit short, but the, uh, the tool is absolutely for free and you can uh, see it on the, uh, on the web. Finally, because that's something we also have to have a look at, it's uh, diffusion-weighted imaging. Diffusion-weighted imaging is very, very popular, mainly due to the fact that it's easy to acquire like just to have some images, not the quality, that's more difficult, and easy to do research on because you actually draw a region of interest and then you get a value and you can compare it, right? Very simple, so all academics say, hooray, let's do research on it. It's a bit over-exaggerated, but still a helpful tool because if you got a Byrats 4 finding and you got a high ABC value above 1.5 uh, multiplied with 10 exponent minus 3 square millimeters per second, it is a benign finding with all likelihood. That has been published several times. It's a prospective and multicentric uh, established cutoff, which has been multicentrically validated and independently. So it's really level of evidence one. And everything which is not 
uh, high ABC value could be everything, could be cancer, uh, and uh, it uh, should be biopsy. That's very straightforward. And the good thing is you can combine this at will with the Kaiser score without any calculations. So you do the Kaiser score, Kaiser score five, well, do I got the ABC? Oh, yes, I got it. The ABC is like 1.9. Well, then it's supposedly uh, benign finding, for instance, a very small uh, fiber adenoma. Now, we have closed this first pass, and, I, and from my side, we are ready for the, uh, for the case discussion, which will actually uh, take up the case I showed initially. But Matthias, do you see any urgent uh, uh, questions or the need for clarifications at this uh, point in time? No, by, by now I didn't get any, but I would strongly encourage you guys um, to, to chat to me. I will collect all this and uh, discuss it with Pascal as we do in all our courses. Uh, please also follow the chat. I just um, forwarded uh, the uh, email address URL of our Kaiser Score app, which is, I think, very useful both for teaching and for quality assurance. Uh, so if you're more interested in the stuff what we are teaching today, uh, please go also on our website here. You will find tons of cases and images for the specific phenotype, uh, how it looks like and what could be the differential diagnosis. Once again, please, uh, Please feel free to comment anytime. Um, and all the questions uh, related to diffusion, because I already getting a lot of Pascal, uh, we will postpone to the real course because diffusion is super sexy. It is here to stay, but it's not the first hand diagnostic tool. Pascal, correct me, please, because you are one of the world leaders here. Uh, but to answer this question, short question can we rely on diffusion to omit biopsy well yes if you can rely on your technology if you're feeling comfortable with your technology and you have a strongly significantly elevated adc yes and as a rule of thumb as a cutoff which has been evidence based validated it's a 1.5 um, adc value but uh, please forgive us if you're not going too de detailed in diffusion because this is uh, this is something for the advanced codes. Okay, Pascal, uh, go ahead, please, and jump right into the cases. Excellent. While I'm going to answer Good. some questions in the chat privately. Excellent. So, case one, uh, it's a 65-year-old woman. She went to screening, and um, we don't know nothing. We don't know whether she went before to screening. But we know that mammography reported um, architectural distortion in the left breast. As it is usual in Austria, if you got dense breast or any finding, you will immediately have an ultrasound workup. And the ultrasound workup was not entirely clear. And she was uh, had a uh, referral to MRI to say, do we need biopsy or not? Have a look at the conventional images. And um, before I say, Dr. Balzer, shouldn't mammography have two views? Yes, it should. But also, again, real life, it's just a real, real life case. Um, the export of the mammogram uh, doesn't work for some reason for this institution, so we always uh, just save this picture here. Uh, Matthias, to, to get a first impression, I would be very uh, interested. Can you can you just open up a quick pirates poll so that we, that we absolutely? Just, I'm a so big fan of that. Yes, because I would be really interested how many people would now say even based on those very simple images. So first, the pictogram is not perfect. So the ultrasound images, they are of the left breast. Uh, I know it's not perfectly uh, documented. That was that was what we had before, uh, before we read the MRI. Um, but the question is actually always, is it now suspicious just based on those findings? And um, would you rather do a biopsy? Uh, well, or you could say Barrett zero would indicate it's all PPV1 repulse, Barrett zero, three and four, there you could think that MRI could be helpful. Uh, we have 33 uh, people responding. That's great. Um, yeah, but take your time. Now the real fun yeah, starts. Absolutely. And uh, today we took, took a little bit more time to share with you some of the basics of our teaching because we realized that this session was overly popular and there are many, many new faces. Uh, and exactly. to no, make sure. technically a bit challenging, especially if you're first year that I like you lose your mobile. 
uh, but take your time because uh, it's it's quite fascinating how often if you have to choose for yourself to you see what you do not see if you do not if you do just listen because if you listen you always think you understand it's it's the same it's at least with me and if you just uh, respond then you see oh probably I didn't know that so we got forty two responders I think that's quite good Matthias I will just close it's it it's perfect it's perfect absolutely perfect and thank you for responding. And um, and uh, it's quite interesting. So uh, only very few of you say it's not a recall. And um, the majority uh, of you, except for three people, say it's definitely a recall. Sam would say Byrates 3. I personally don't like so much the Byrates 3 solution in this case. Why? Because um, at these images, at least what we have here, it's, there's an asymmetric density of the, of the left breast. I think that it's, it's definitely that there is something denser. Um, whether as a real architectural distortion based on these images has been described in the report, I don't definitely see it. Um, but where I did an ultrasound, there's something. I don't see a real mass. Uh, it could be just weird breast tissue, but it's in a way documented that I don't know what it is. And I think probably benign findings should really be something definite, like something you can do a real follow-up. In this case, I think you can't really say what it is. So. I think Barrett 3 would be my least, least preferred choice. Barrett 0 is what uh, this is typically in Austria. Barrett 0 means we need further imaging and I can't, I can't say something. And Barrett 4, I absolutely agree also with those uh, 40% because there is an, there's, a, there's an abnormal finding, right? There's an asymmetric density and there's something on ultrasound. And even if I don't definitely see it, I, would, I, I need to do something. So Barrett 4 means Actually, if I don't have a negative MRI or something, I would do a biopsy and be it just somewhere. I think what we also can agree on is that we don't see a definite finding. We don't see a definite lesion here. So probably it makes sense to do the MRI and you recognize this MRI scan. It was the one I showed you with the standardized layout. And as I told you, you will link everything together so you can zoom in and scroll together. And now we see a lesion. And, and Pascal, it, I already opened the poll. I think we have been talked enough. I certainly had, and you maybe too also. And now you would relax, have a coffee or a tea, or maybe even a, a little sip of uh, white wine, and, and you read the case now yourself on your poll, which is um, most likely open on your secondary device. You can go through the questions, and these are the key diagnostic criteria what you need for doing your assessment in breast MR, speculation, margin, curve, internal enhancement, and edema. And very, very important and are the default criteria, which Pascal already uh, explained. So anytime you're not 100% sure that it's nothing specific, then you please choose default. So as a, just a, a rule of thumb, show this case to yourself another day or to your friend who is an MSK specialist and he's not 100% sure that this is not default, you go for default. So in other words, call a speculation only speculation if you're 100% sure it is. If it's not a textbook one, don't use the criteria. The same applies for persistent washout, etc. And you will realize that um, the Kaiser score is applicable not only to mass lesions. You can apply it to non-mass lesions as well. We don't distinguish between it. If you use structured reporting birets, which is what we do, of course, I write, for instance, it's a segmental clump non-mass, but you can still apply those criteria even to an absolutely cloud-like unstructured non-mass because you always have criteria like then it's not speculated, it's not circumscribed, and so on and so on. Very important with the curve also, you should always focus at the most suspicious curve. It's, you can be very quickly fooled, in particular in non-mass lesions, to, uh, to underestimate the enhancement curve type because persistent enhancement uh, seems to be uh, a dominant. It's not the dominant finding, it's the most suspicious finding, but one you can see. As you can also see, we do a visual assessment of the lesion because it's a standardized window center settings. And before you draw a region of interest to measure a curve, you need the visual assessment, right? So it is actually not so much reliable and actually biased on your visual assessment. And many studies have shown that visual assessment is much faster and rather more specific. 
You can also do computer-assisted curve type assessment or volumetric curve type assessment, all fine, but you need to be aware that this is less specific. It would be more sensitive, but less specific. The curve type you see, which is a plateau, is unspecific. A curve type you see that is a definite washout is definitely suspicious. And a curve type you see, which is a, a persistent enhancement, should be benign. So now we got 41. Uh, uh, exactly. So while, while, while we explained some of the details and Please do not expect to share with you all details in one hour. That's not possible. Also, we'd love to be that. So while we use some of the time doing you answer the polls, we got all my, all, well, all, already 41. And uh, yeah, let's go through the list. So 85% of you said, I am pretty sure this is a textbook speculation. Only 15 said no because I'm not sure about that or I'm sticking back to default. It's maybe a speculation, but in this case, not that sure. Pascal, what, what do you make about that? Excellent. I think that's exactly what's to be expected. I think this is a speculated lesion. It's definitely speculated, but it's not a showcase of speculation. That's why I choose it. Um, so I think 85%, it's fine. And as we said, default category is always fine. There's no right and wrong in this assessment. Semantic criteria, you have to find a common language. That's the thing with the, with the default criteria. It's, it's like language. We have to understand ourselves. There's no right and wrong. There's no right or wrong word. The curve type assessment is more difficult, as we can see. Uh, 41% said we will rather stick with the with the default criterion. Eight have seen a washout. Matthias, have you seen a washout visually? This would be rather over specific. I wouldn't call this here spot washout, at least at, at, at this screen I have here, which is a pretty decent one. But no, I would go to default in that case, actually. Me too. Uh, and the overall impression by nearly 40% that it is persistent, that's exactly the pitfall you can have. Of course, the majority, if you look at this, is persistent. But look at, for instance, this margin in the outer lower or to the thoracic wall part, that's definitely not persistent. It's uh, also, if you look at the subtractions, uh, you can see that this is a plateau enhancement. So that's what I would uh, assign. But I see, you see, it's much more difficult. We will later see also in the Kaiser score flow chart, how flexible the Kaiser score is against this. So margins, non-circumscribed, I think that is absolutely true. The three of you say circumscribed, always the most suspicious thing counts. And I don't think that you can call this inner part circumscribed. It's definitely, even if you didn't assign, uh, assign uh, no speculations, uh, it's definitely not a circumscribed finding. And the majority is in line. The internal announcement is heterogeneous. Uh, that's definite. Also, the six who say it's homogeneous or centrifugal. Uh, I know there's, there's a, the nomenclature is very difficult. Centrifugal means I go out, and centripetal means the rim announcement that closes itself. And that's rather the one which we see here. Uh, it's a centripetal enhancement, and the centripetal enhancement fills itself up. And I guess that the six of you who, who choose this option thought rather it's centripetal. And then uh, at least 40%, and that makes me very, very happy, I have seen a perifocal edema. And of course, I switched between two slices. But this year, you see it's a T2 sequence with long eco time. You see that there is some signal which is brighter than the fatty tissue around, you see? And that is perifocal edema. And perifocal edema is a very critical criterion. If the patient has not been biopsied, uh, if there has not been uh, radiation therapy, then an edema is a strong uh, hint at malignancy if it's focused. Of course, in, in uh, mastitis, you can also have some diffuse edema, but edema is always an alarm sign. So if we look at the Kaiser score flowchart, because you can also just print it out and follow it, and you immediately learn it by heart. Pascal, let's, let's, let's ask the attendees yeah. to do this just themselves. I mean, Jay, I will just open exactly. it quickly. No, no, no. That was I, what I just wanted ah, to suggest, Matthias. Isn't that a great, great synchronization? All right, I, I, I'm, I'm silent. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I'm going back to the images. So that's the Kaiser score flowchart. Matthias showed you also the... Uh, the uh, I think you sent also the tree, or you sent at least the link to the to the decision support tool, right? I did send the link to the decision support tool. I think that's fair enough for the beginner session, and we will find more material on our website. And yeah, so follow follow the 
Uh, did you already open it, the, the Kaiser score poll, or should we? No, I'm just about to do that. Uh, excellent. So I don't. Uh... I see the old one, Kaiser score by 1 to 11 English. I already started it, right? I did. Don't worry about that. I'm your personal assistant today. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, the thing is, virtually, um, if, if you were the personal assistant, that would be great because I, I would like to have a cup of tea, probably. <laughs> <laughs> that, so, that, that, that's for the hologram. Okay, go ahead. You are responding. 14 have responded. I'm, I'm very proud of you. It's actually rather, rather fastish. And you know, time is, in this case, not money. Time is cases. Matthias, am I am I pressuring again? You know, I, I would I, I would take it easy uh, in this case and then uh, increase the speed. So we have absolutely. This is not about getting the more, most cases. The first case we always take our time. You can leave us obviously any time. This is just you know for fun and for sharing cases. But uh, the first case we will take more time to get everybody on board. And once again, if you have to leave, we will put a video version of this session on our YouTube channel. And how oh. to assess that, I'm going to show later. Pascal. Matthias, did I, did I wipe my glasses? Can you, can you see them wear clean glasses? If you, if you would have <laughs> told me before that you videotaped this. <laughs> 29 responders. Readiness Come is on. all. We will meet the 40. Ha, now. Now, I had a feeling, 34 we got, 36. I think it's fair enough. We, we can, I think, close it. 40 something should be our benchmark, but I think for this case, it's fair enough. So we see a lot of, a lot of Kaiser scores. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So that's a lot. And you would think, oh my. The most common uh, were seven with 17% and then 10 with 61%, which is to me the most likely correct response because my personal choice would have been, I see speculations, I see a plateau enhancement and I see a peripheral edema and that's a Kaiser score of 11. But now the Kaiser score is quite friendly. There's no correct solution. So you've seen the speculations and you've seen the plateau announcement, but I'm sorry, Dr. Walzer, I didn't see your plateau. You're at Kaiser score seven, and it still means biopsy, right? Also, you might said, have said, well, I don't see a speculation. Sorry, Dr. Walzer, but I see the plateau announcement. It's very unspecific. The margins are not circumscribed. That's really some, that's something I would really say, no, sorry, it's not circumscribed. That's something we should really uh, close of our margins. And this was the nomenclature with the centrifugals, also not centrifugals. So these options will be the only ones I would definitely exclude. However, let me point out that this year is not likely. Persistent announcement was not the most suspicious curve. I think it would have been a misinterpretation of the curve type. Um, so I don't think that persistent is entirely correct. So if you end up at that, at that irregular uh, enhancement you should and that's always important you get a score like from the Kaiser score and if you end up with such a result you should always check the plausibility of the findings and of course in this case postmenopausal women new finding on MRI and enhancing mass I mean come on it's just the, the clinical history says well I would double check the ref it's weird benign findings so most likely we should have a Kaiser score of uh, of uh, 10 or 7 I think 10 is really, in this case, rather simple. If it didn't uh, rate the speculations, you would at least should arrive at the Kaiser score of 5, which is also suspicious. And, well, what was the histology? Ah, no, I, I just, Matthias, I just forgot it. Because I wrote here, not only that the Kaiser score is above 5, we should do a biopsy, but we have our safety net, which is uh, the ADC. And let's go back because I write something like real diffusion hindrance. Because as I said before, 
a low or unspecific ADC doesn't say anything. It just says it's not definitely benign. But we got one combination, if you let me go back, where we can really say it's very likely suspicious. And that is on the diffusion rated image, and it's, by the way, a calculated high B value, there we see a high signal intensity. And if the high signal intensity is there, it means there must be enough water in the tissue to measure diffusion, right? And if then, if there is water and it's so dark on the ADC map, you can measure it and 0.8 and so on, then you know, okay, this is for sure a diffusion hindrance, meaning that's a real cancer-like diffusion. So in this case, should have been suspicious, and this is a second factor pointing out that this should have been uh, considered a suspicious finding. And then what came out of it, uh, the biopsy revealed uh, an invasive ductal carcinoma, G2 of luminal B type, HER2 positive in addition. Next case, Martin. There's one question, Pascal. I think it makes sense to, to, to focus on yeah. that because it comes yeah. from our good friends and uh, breast imaging experts. So based on MR location, can we just try to find it also on the mammogram? Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, on the mammogram, the issue is uh, it's, it's, it's central. It's central. I think the central density there is the lesion. However, here is some architectural distortion. And what I did just for the brevity, for the sake of brevity, there was also an additional non-mass lesion, Kaiser score 7, uh, also associated it. So it's a little bit more than only this mass lesion uh, has been uh, vis visible there. So basically, the whole affected area was really with central gland, where it is so dense. And of course, the hypoechoic uh, structures there were just probably it was, was a bad ultrasound. Probably they didn't compress because when we did the targeted ultrasound, it was actually a quite evident cancer to us. This was just what was documented, what we had at the time point of the MRI. In this case, I really choose the case because it's a very simple, very straightforward, actually nearly potato cancer. For our early detection, uh, 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 it's, it's really, it's nearly two centimeters. It's actually for MRI, uh, uh, for MRI, it's rather big. We got a second case, and as I said, rather big. I will now show you a very small one. 48-year-old uh, woman screaming, negative family history. She has dense breasts in Austria. She will, uh, she will undergo a subsequent ultrasound. And that revealed complicated cysts, some weird type of ecogen uh, ecogenic lesions on both breasts. So what is it? Should I do now virus free? And in the end, it's a cancer. So she underwent MRI because in Austria, we already have very, very uh, low threshold access to MRI uh, in, in such cases. The reason of MRI was exclude breast cancer. And if there is a biopsy target, find the biopsy target. And in this case, and this is not necessarily the case, it was a complicated case on ultrasound and on uh, mammography, but the MRI was very clear because one of the first things I check, I check, of course, for the contrast. Do I have contrast injected? Yes, the heart is enhancing. There should be contrast. And then what about the tissue, the normal breast tissue, which is rather dense? Uh, do I have background parenchyma enhancement? And no, I don't. I have a single focus of enhancement and we zoom in and I'll have a look. And Matthias, I think we can just try either the Kaiser score or the Kaiser score description with the speculations here. Um, start starting with the speculations here. Uh, in order Let, to let's do the descriptors audio. once more because not everyone yeah. is an breast MR expert, just to repeat. And no, then no. already by thinking about descriptors, make your own Kaiser score. And there we go. Neustarten. And please. And interactively, you may also go to our website uh, and, and check the images for each criteria plus uh, to calculate the score if you're not yet that familiar with the score. Yeah, and take your time. Because this is now a small lesion, the lesion size is approximately five millimeters, probably 5.5 millimeters, so small lesion. Um, I, I uh, saved two subsequent slides. You can see here what they look like. It's a two millimeter slice thickness in this examination. So we're a bit limited by 
partial volume effects, making it much more difficult to assess such lesions. And we still got already 30 responders. Yeah, let's wait for 40. That's our benchmark. There it is. So we got 44 even. So we show the results, speculations. The majority of you have seen the speculations. I agree. I think I would call this speculated. It could be, and I couldn't exclude, that it's like a tongue-like protrusion. And tongue-like protrusion would be rather typical of like fibrodynomatory type of plasia. Speculation is something like that. And there are something like that. So can't exclude whether these things are really rather roundish or not. They are small. In case of thought, I would rather go for positive. So I would have said speculations. Just out of interest, Matthias, what would you have said? Speculations or rather just non-circumscribed? I, I would actually, in this case, at this resolution, stick to default. And this is actually... Very fair. So you're with the 30%, and I think it's absolutely... Maybe on a... But th 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 that's very important. Like we cannot repeat it once again. There are many, many ways to roam, uh, all leading to the center. Uh, it's not important whether you take the first left and the second right. It's You have to go together. And I'm pretty sure we will end up all in the same diagnostic category. So, no, the short answer... Right? Yeah. The curve type, um, I think if you look at it uh, early and late and if you mask it, in this case, it's very simple because there's no background in answer. And I think especially on the subtractions, you can easily depict what you can also see on the original images, namely that the late phase enhancement is more dark than the early phase enhancement, which would be a visual washout. I think it's rather evident, uh, especially if you zoom in. But in case of doubt, plateau is always right. Just persistent, this is for sure not. It's not becoming definitely brighter. If it's if anything, it's becoming darker. It's not a persistent signal increase. A persistent signal increase must become brighter. In this case, it's rather becoming darker, but can I understand if you say, well, I don't know. I can't, I can't really definitely say it. So uh, then we got the margins. I think that the margins are not circumscribed because Wherever you've got some of those protrusions, um, I would rather say not circumscribed. Matthias, do you think, uh, can you can you understand, would you say circumscribed? Because at least 10, one out of five said that it's circumscribed. Well, first of all, t according to my math, uh, this is still a minority and I'm happy with that. Having said that, having, ha having said that, um, uh, I, I wouldn't call it circumscribed because um, for that, again, it has to be uh, textbooks uh, non-circumscribed, and this is not the case here. I get the point why someone tries to call the circumscribed, but already if you're trying, if you have to try, you have to, have to push the diagnosis, you're already in a default category. Very, very, this is very, very important. And I think, Pascal, you already said it, but I'm always a big fan of over-repeating stuff because I'm, I'm getting tired now. Uh, you can shouldn't be afraid of uh, missing a cancer in breast MR. That's not the danger. The danger, and this is what really kills the method and has been killing all re almost, well, at least the method is struggling with it. You can over, over, overuse the method and then you run into the problem of a low specificity. So don't be afraid of missing a cancer. Be afraid of being too, uh, too unspecific. And this is why we urge you, urge you to use the default category. Now comes a difficult and probably one of the teaching points here, internal enhancement. The majority of 80% says it's homogeneous, which it is at first glance, but especially if you look at the late phase enhancement, and here it's very small findings, and the resolution of MRI is not as good as mammography or ultrasound, but it actually should probably magnify it, even if it gets a bit pixelated, because I think if you look here, that part is definitely brighter than that part of the lesion. Even though the lesion probably persists of, of, of very small voxels here, some of the voxels are brighter than the others. And in a very small lesion, it's really one pitfall uh, to think it's definitely benign, we, we, uh, to, to uh, describe definitely benign figures. I think even, at least on my uh, not the best PC laptop screen, uh, I see some heterogeneity. But well, it's, it's, if you think it's homogeneous, I will urge you five millimeter lesions, be very careful with that because it's one of the very, very few pitfalls in diagnostic interpretation. 
and the majority sees no edema and no, there is no edema here. If some of you thought for people, there is something bright, yeah, that's a cyst, that's a cyst, that's a ductasia, that's normal fluid in the tissue. And that's a chemical shift artifact in the vessel. There is no edema whatsoever here uh, in the breast. Uh, let's go to the Kaiser score. Matthias, do you, would you, would you uh, do another Kaiser score poll or should, I, should we just arrive at my um, diagnosis? Because then we probably take the five over minutes for those who would like to stay five minutes to have the next much more interesting uh, leash. Even more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go, go ahead. I think we are now in working temperature. And for those of you who want to go easy, uh, uh, relax through the case again, once again, watch the video transcript of this and do it again on YouTube. I think right. this, is, this would be my personal interpretation because I see a definite washout and I see a speculation. Um, that's, that's what I would say. Um, we have again a real diffusion hindrance. Let's just quickly go back. You can see the lesion only on this slide, uh, on this slide. And you see there is a real lesion that is a real diffusion hindrance again. It's bright and here it's dark, and that's the combination uh, that points out cancer. Furthermore, for all of you, and in this case, we don't discuss the other, op uh, 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 the other options of assigning the Kaiser score. It is a perimenopausal woman with a definite strong enhancement and nothing else there. And it's not an absolute roundish, but a bizarre lesion. I think it is a recall also based on clinic and age of the patient. So biopsy reviewed uh, a luminal. Uh, type NST G2. And now, regrettably, last case is a young woman, 37. Oh, today. It's kind of for today, we've got tons of cases. <laughs> what for today? No, we got uh, e even in this in this in this presentation, we got more cases. So, uh, 37 year old woman, positive family history. She has a new palpable finding in her left breast, and reason for MRI was. Uh, she had then ultrasound and it revealed again multiple findings in both breasts, which really looked horrible on ultrasound. Question was, do we need a biopsy? And it, because, yeah, positive family history, her mother had cancer with 52, uh, but is it really something? So if yes, there. Again, we see now it's really dense breasts, right? And we zoom in at the strongest enhancing finding. And actually, it's two findings, if you now subtly look. We will discuss the, the, not discuss both findings because the first finding, this mass lesion here, it's a circumscribed, it's barely enhancing. It shows a persistent enhancement, a circumscribed T2 correlate. And if we measure diffusion, it has a low diffusion. That's called, uh, it's called uh, either a T2 blackout. So we double check what does this look like on the, uh, on the diffusion image, on the diffusion image, it's bright, so it's not a so-called T2 blackout, but, and that's the bad thing, fibroadenomas can have some proteinaceous fluid inside, and then that has a, somehow a diffusion hindrance. So not all fibroadenomas are bright on ABC. So that's the reason why we do not upgrade findings based on a low ABC value. But now, the lesion we are interested in, and Matthias, probably you can open the, the descriptor, descriptor rating, is the strongly enhancing lesion. Is it a cancer or is it no cancer? That's what we want to know. Uh, and I have one representative slide. It is somehow a little bit heterogeneous, right, Matthias? So should we call that cancer or not? And I hope I got you right, Pascal. I opened the, the, the general descriptor yes, sheet, yes, yes, yes. Which, exactly which, which, makes, yeah, which makes most sense. Just give me a second, I will respond to the um, questions in the chat. And thank you all for engaging with us. This is really awesome. So in a parallel, while Pascal is doing the main job in front of the microphone, I'm trying to get ahead with all the questions. This is, this is basically the main job, right? So 18, well, I got the pleasure to see your responses coming in. Uh, we can, of course, say it's a mass lesion. Um, the non-mass lesions are exactly following after this case. Um, but I think it's very important to have some exemplary mass lesions discussed. They are supposed to be benign, uh, but sometimes they are not so much. Uh, in this case, 
I think, uh, and something we also uh, already uh, we, we need to consider in the patient management then is uh, is the the family history and the age of the patient, uh, and also the fact that she has multiple findings. Even though this was a unique finding, I can tell you, even without looking through the images. So I closed the poll because it all responded. We got uh, seventy people who say speculations. In this case. I don't see a definite speculation. I think I know what you're pointing out. Uh, it's that one. But you see, if you go to the original, I think it's rather a tongue-like protrusion. And uh, also if you check the late phase, so here it's not so, I, I don't think that there is a speculation that you can in any way really argue with someone who says it's no speculation. We don't have real argument. This is a speculation because, so I would not assign it like the majority. The curve that is much, much more difficult. Again, as I said, you are quickly fooled to think, well, everything is persistent. You keep one part of the lesion, check one part. You can also use a pick sensor. Of course, you can draw an ROI. But if you look at the septum or whatever this is, uh, this is for sure not definitely brighter here than it is there, right? If you compare it, probably the overall lesion gets brighter, but no. Uh, on the same end, I don't see a definite washout. Again, I I think I see, I think because of the other announcement, you could for instance say probably isn't that a washout. I would say no. For me, it's a rather default because it's not a definite yes or a definite no. The margins, 66% uh, say it's circumscribed. 34% uh, say it's not circumscribed. I absolutely agree with this. I actually struggled myself. If you scroll for this, and in this case, I didn't want to push billions of images, you would have said that rather it's circumscribed based on T2 images. Because on the T2 images, uh, here it's a partial volume effect. You can't really see the lesion. You can't see, like on the other lesion, that it has rather circumscribed margins. So going to the default category is right, uh, in my opinion. And it's definitely not homogeneous enhancement. And it's even probably a centripetal enhancement, which could be considered a cancer criterion because there the center does not so much enhance. And there the center seems to enhance at least a bit more. I'm not so sure about that. One criterion pointing out that's rather benign is the stability of the morphology over time. Because if you look at the lesion, it has a bizarre and heterogeneous internal enhancement, but it looks very much the same in the late and in the early enhanced images. And cancers tend, tend, it's not an absolute yes or no, tend to be heterogeneous during the enhancement phases. Edema uh, is not seen. There is no edema, and the majority also has seen not an edema. 20% has said an edema. I applaud you for your sensitivity. I mean, there's some pseudocystic part. There is also some pseudo, probably internal cystic part. That's a cyst. Um, I don't see a real uh, edema. I would, uh, if someone says, so I've seen a definite one, but there's no definite edema. No. So we go to the Kaiser score. And my personal reading in this case would be no speculation. A plateau enhancement, circumscript margins, Kaiser score two. And we biopsied it because the patient insisted on it and she had a palpation finding, which by the way was something else. Um, but, and it was a fibroadenoma, so it's a benign lesion B2. But again, as, as uh, I always keep to uh, tend to, to uh, have not a proper look at diffusion, here we see the lesion, it's bright and corresponding to T2. And here, we cannot distinguish it from the surrounding tissue. We can now draw a region of interest within the enhancing part of the lesion and copy it there. And then we measure, oh, the ADC value is very high. So in this case, also the ADC value says it should be benign. And that is all in line with a fiber adenoma. I usually say, if you see something which looks weird in the breast, a mass lesion, it's usually a fiber adenoma. Everything which looks really out of the place it's usually a fibroadenoma. This is a very typical finding of a fibroadenoma. But yes, to my absolute regret, I think our time has run up and we somehow have to close our today's session, right? Yes, I think so. So this is a teaser. Uh, everyone who knows us knows that we would love to do this for hours. Today, I have to go for a swim with my kids because it's so hot here in, in, in Bavaria. They are already... Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, well, it's 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 it, it's still well. It, it, it sunset is at half past nine, at least in our place. Uh, yeah, and, it's a bit because we're more south, yeah. yeah. So please forgive us uh, if we do now the wrap up. But as I said, uh, 
Please don't be disappointed. This was intended to be a teaser, nothing more. But at least I hope you enjoyed a little bit of the teaser. And let's just quickly wrap up this. Um, while Pascal has been doing the main job in front of the microphone during the course, I try to catch up with the chat list, which was tremendously active. I really like that. If I didn't answer any and all a uh, question, please forgive me and write just an email or text me on uh, either social media you like. Quick wrap up. Uh, I want to thank you because it's tough. It's been most likely a tough day for you as it has been for all of us, though Pascal also. So joining us uh, at this wonderful time of the year for one hour discussing some odd cases with two two guys in front of the microphone. It's, 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 it's not, it's, it's, it's really an honor for us. And um, yeah, we, we are really passionate about doing that. But all beside passion and fun, it has to be and is hopefully you agree content driven. So thanks to the team behind, because without the team, uh, no one can succeed. Uh, all the technical stuff, all the people. Uh, what's next? Um, please send us a feedback uh, in the poll, which I will now open. Um, this is important and because it helps us to improve our courses, specifically the courses um, we are doing for breast M MR. Here it comes. Uh, and Please leave also uh, your comment if you wish. This is not for PR. This is really helpful. We are a very small platform. We don't want to concur with everybody. We just want to share our knowledge. And we would love to see you again. I already read in the chat that we will see many faces in Nizza and Valencia, uh, wherever. We are all also very fond of personal reunions. If you are at a, some major conference, just email us, text us, a cup of coffee or water, or eventually even a wine or beer. So, uh, this is shouldn't be, and please uh, don't misunderstand us, uh, a promo show, but for those of who do not know yet that we have one-day courses, here's the invitation, July 1st and July 9th, basic course, advanced course. I have to try to, to answer all questions in the chat, but there were many questions about multimodal imaging, where's the MLO, where's the CC, where, uh, yeah, you're all right, but we can't do all in one hour. Uh, this is the reason why we're doing really these crash courses for one day, a basic course and the advanced course. This is the real thing. We cordially invite you. And if you have problems to join us there according to a time zone or according to your call schedule, not, don't worry. Uh, you will get a video transcript. And if you have canceled short notice, you obviously can book it or it can be found at our homepage, schoolofradiology.com slash courses. And uh, we are here for friends, not only in the auditory, but also with the lectures. We have been friends with Laszlo Tabar for many years, and he kindly agreed to give his summer school by the one and only Laszlo Tabar a late July choral invitation, and there will be a trailer. So, uh, to answer uh, in short the question how to get the updates on our, um, the School of Radiology, just leave an abo at our channel at YouTube at School of Radiology and you will get a notice every time we upload a new video, like likely tomorrow morning, when we will prepare the video of today's course. And please follow us uh, at LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, wherever you want, not to miss the upcoming uh, version uh, of this case reading session and many more to come. We are doing this not uh, as our first job, just as a extended hobby version. So we do not have yet the uh, dates of the next breast MR reading session. It's going to be most likely in Q4. But if you follow me, you will get everything you need. That's from my side. And as usual, as usual, the final word belongs to Pascal, who has been responsible for the real stuff, for the real content today. Pascal. Matthias, that's, uh, that's very kind of you. Uh, dear all, it's, uh, it has been great that you have joined in. Uh, thank you for all the questions uh, and uh, thank you, Matthias, for responding to the questions. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to meeting you, uh, be it in person, uh, be it in uh, another online meeting. It has been a pleasure and I wish you all a wonderful day, evening, morning, wherever you are now and stay safe. Ah, uh, Matthias, no, I don't, uh, I don't, don't listen. So, yeah, yeah, I, I muted myself because who should and uh, ever could interrupt you? <laughs> ah, so, Matthias, Matthias, it's a good thing because this today, 
my beach works. I have to say bye bye. I'm going to the beach now. It's my it's my leisure time. Um, and I wish you a wonderful uh, wonderful day. <laughs> as said. You see, Matthias. Well, also, the sun is still shining. Yeah, 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 yeah. I could actually upload a, a picture from the pool, uh, but uh, I don't because I am already getting a little tired. I have to be I have to be honest. But anyway, I want to thank you once again for joining. So to follow us on our social media channels, not to miss the updates on the School of Radiology and when the video is posted. And in case of any questions, just reach out by email. The only thing what we don't have is a fax. Otherwise, you can contact us. <laughs> <laughs> <And videotape>. <laughs> <laughs> Good.